morning all. I hope we were definitely enjoying ourselves. I I, I saw several individuals uh, doing the moves, uh, including our 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 fellow um, committee member Natasha. Well done with a baby in the hand also. So uh, greetings, sisters, brothers, and comrades. My name is Ainsworth Spence, Equity Co-Chair of the Toronto New York Region Labor Council. It is great to see you all on this wonderful and sunny side of the morning. At least where am I? <laughs> um, and it truly highlights your commitments as unionists and activists. Uh, we have an amazing morning planned for all of us. So welcome and thank you for being here. Today you will hear from several dynamic speakers, spoken word artists, and partake in several compelling and timely workshops. I'm confident we will all hear, we will all leave here today feeling empowered to continue to fight against oppression and discrimination in our world today. Before we move into the agenda, I want to take the opportunity to acknowledge our committee members who have worked diligently in putting this conference together. Ralph, Gobi, Keith, Natasha, Bill, Kingsley, Velma, Joy, and of course, my fellow co-chair, Danica Izzard. And a big thank you to the Toronto and York Region Labor Council staff who have worked tirelessly to make today possible. Danica will now begin with our line acknowledgement. Danica. Thank you, Ainsworth. Let us begin by pausing to respectfully acknowledge the land. I would like to acknowledge that this conference is taking place upon occupied land. It is the traditional territories of the Huron-Wendat, Ashnabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. These nations and this land were subject to the one, one dish and one spoon wampum belt covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the land and its resources. Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. We are all treaty people and must be mindful of broken covenants and strive to make this right with the land and with each other. We ask that you all take the time to consider your relationship with the land and your individual responsibility to read and support the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada 94 Calls to Action and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We'd like to acknowledge those that came, those of us who came here involuntarily, particularly as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. And so we honor and pay tribute to the ancestors of the African, African origin and, des and um, descent. Before we continue, I'd like to take a minute of silence in mourning for victims of racism and colonialism, including the family that was murdered last week, um, Salman Afsal, 46, his 44-year-old wife, Mariha Salman, and their 15-year-old daughter, Yamna Afzal, and Afzal's 70-year-old mother, and the 215 Indigenous children whose bodies were found in the Kamloops Residential School. So if we could all now take a minute of silence. Thank you. 
I suggest that you now look in your conference package, um, which um, one of my one of our um, my colleagues will um, enter into uh, the the chat for you. Um, there's a there's a PDF. And you'll be able to access on page nine of the conference package at the top of the page where it says sign petition. You can click on it and it will take you to the CLC page where you can sign the petition to let the federal and provincial leaders and elected representatives to know that you want to see real commitments and concrete actions for justice for Indigenous peoples and communities. So again, that's on page nine of the conference package. And I would, I would urge you to um, make sure that you go and do that today if you don't do that, don't take the time to do that right now. So now I'm going to um, turn things over to um, fellow committee member, Ralph, Chator, who will be today's ombudsperson, who's going to read the harassment statement. If you have any concerns, you can reach Ralph by sending him a private message using the meeting chat. Good morning, brothers and sisters, and comrades. Mutual respect, cooperation, and understanding are strongly held principles of our movement. We will neither condone nor tolerate harassing or discriminatory behavior that creates an intimidating, hostile, or offensive environment and undermines the dignity or self-esteem of any individual. An injury to one is an injury to all. Speech or conduct which is racist, sexist, homophobic, discriminatory, or personally harmful is unacceptable and only serves to devise us. Our event today must respect this commitment to equity, and we will work together for justice and dignity in our workplaces, our unions, and our communities. Danica. Thank you, Ralph. So, um, I, I'm just going to um, to note for people um, if you experience any uh, any technical issues um, or, or problems, please send a direct message uh, in the chat to um, to the Labor Council. Um, there's someone named Labor Council to Rochelle or to Simon. Um, they'll be able to assist you. Okay. Um, so now. I would like to introduce our first guest, who will start with our Indigenous welcome and reflection. Merv King is from the uh, Tamath. Sorry, and I, I hope that I, I I apologize if I mispronounce this. Um, Tamas King First Nations. He is also the creator of the USW Indigenous Scholarship Program that awards a scholarship to achieve to active or retired members of the United Steelworkers or their children, grandchildren, or immediate family members who self-identify as First Nation, First Nations, Inuit, or Métis, and, and who pursue post-secondary education in Canada, including a skilled trades program at a college or technical institute. Prior, priority is given to applicants who live in remote regions and will attend school far away from home. Merv is also the coordinator of the Steelworkers Toronto Area Council Injured Workers Program. He is a member of USW Human Rights Committee, the National Aboriginal Community. He is a staunch activist on Indigenous issues and climate change. You can read Merv's extended bio in the conference package. So thank you very much for being here today and welcome Merv.
Yeah, good morning. I'm Merv King, sisters and brothers, and I'm an Algonquin from uh, the uh, Temiskaming First Nation and a member of the Bear Clan, and also a proud steelworker. Thank you for having me today uh, to make these opening statements and remarks at the 18th Indigenous Workers uh, Workers and uh, Workers of Color Conference. Racism is on everyone's mind nowadays. Inspired by the civil rights movement of the 1960s, First Nations began to fight for their rights. The residential school system was well entrenched into Canadian society as a means to assimilate First Nations into the fabric of settler culture. Senator Murray Sinclair said, education got us into this mess and education will get us out. You all know the legacy of the residential schools and the trauma and intergenerational trauma that they created from the first school opening in 1876 to the last one closing in 1996. The purpose was to kill the Indian and the child. And as John A. McDonald said, get rid of the Indian problem. Mike Harris cut the funding for reserve schools in 1996, creating a gap in education that still exists today. And in 2018, Doug Ford scrapped the truth and reconciliation curriculum uh, as it was ready to be put into the school system and it had already been paid for. He also cut the indigenous cultural funds. You can see that there's been little progress when it comes to reconciliation. June is Indigenous Peoples History Month and June 21st, Indigenous Peoples Day. This year, more than past years, there's a great sadness across Turtle Island with the discovery of 215 Indigenous children buried at a mass grave site at the residential school in Kamloops, British Columbia. I'd ask that we take a moment of silence for these lost souls and the many more that are buried at other residential schools across Canada yet to be found and brought home. Miigwech, thank you. I would ask that you join me and demand that 215 children be identified and returned to their communities and that the 139 other residential schools be examined for buried and forgotten children. Systemic racism towards First Nations has been happening since the first explorer set foot on Turtle Island. The Indian Act of 1876 still in effect today is the most racist legislation in Canadian history. Indigenous people had to have written permission to leave the reserve up until 1951, and they were given the right to vote in 1960, many for the first time after serving in one of the two great wars. Continuous and systemic oppression by provincial and federal governments has led to the silencing of Indigenous voices. Their concerns are met with such little government recognition that the only way to get the attention of the governments is to stop the commerce of the country by stopping the railroads, the roads, highways, and the waterways. It seems that the only time governments listen and pay attention is when it costs them money. Those raids on, and the destruction of the Mi'kmaq First Nation fishing facilities reflects the the racist assault on Indigenous people, undermining the treaty rights to fish and earn a modest living. Whether it's the West Sutton opposition to the Trans Mountain Pipeline, the Six Nations 1492 land defenders, a fight for clean drinkable water and sanitation, and the fight to stop clear cutting of old growth forest and the demanding for justice for missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. First Nations are supporting one another from coast to coast, a dream come true for Tecumseh, who, had to, who tried to get all of the tribes to unite with the Shawnee to stop the U.S. expansion into Native American lands. 
The struggles of workers, workers of color and indigenous workers are very similar. Both want to be treated with respect, equality and justice for past wrongs and share a hope for a better future. We must find the collective strength to fight for each other. We have seen the toppling of the statue of Edgerton Ryerson, a demand to change the name of the school as he was a principal architect in the residential school system. Watching the news footage was amazing to see a group of diverse people in solidarity and support. First Nations, Métis and Inuit want the governments to acknowledge the past atrocities and genocide committed against them and enact the 94 Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action, most notably calls 71 to 76, dealing with residential schools. Call to action 73 reads, we call upon the federal government to work with the churches, Aboriginal communities, and former residential school students to establish and maintain an online registry of residential school cemeteries, including where possible, plot maps showing the location of deceased residential children. The foundation for the oppression and violation of Indigenous human rights dates back to the doctrine of discovery, a concept of, of public international law which laid claim to lands belonging to non-Christian sovereign nations during an age of discovery. European Christian governments would lay claim and title to non-Christian lands on the basis that the colonizers traveled and discovered these territories. They brought Bibles and gave them to us. And now that we have the Bibles and they have our land. Sitting Bull, a Lakota chief from Standing Rock and a victim of systemic racism once said, let us put our minds together and see what life we can make for our children. I would like to add to that and say, let us create a world where we live in harmony, free from racism and hatred. Once again, I thank you for having me. Have a great conference. Miigwech. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, um, for that Merv. Our next speaker is going to speak about the impact of hate. Amira Elgawabi, and again, I apologize if I have mispronounced your name, is a journalist and human rights advocate who serves as a political assistant to the president of the Canadian Labour Congress. Along with appearances on Canadian and international news networks, Amira is a contributing columnist for the Toronto Star. Before joining the Canadian Labour Congress, Amira spent five years promoting the civil liberties of Canadian Muslims as human rights officer, and later as director of communications at the National Council of Canadian Muslims, the NCCM. Amira is currently involved with several initiatives to promote civil engagement in diverse communities. Welcome Amira, and thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much, Danica, for having me, and thanks to everyone um, for giving me the space at your conference this morning. Uh, it is real uh, honor. Thank you, Murph, for your um, comments uh, as well. And I just want to say that you know I stand in solidarity with my Indigenous communities, and um, you know we were just really still reeling from the discovery of the 215 children in Kamloops uh, when the latest tragedy and they are certainly connected in terms of the impacts of white supremacy and colonialism and the way that hate uh, manifests itself across communities and all of us experience that in different ways but there are those connections and and so um, you know it's really been a very difficult uh, few weeks for for many of us um, I'm here in Ottawa I am on um, the Algonquin Anishinaabe territory which I'm truly grateful and humbled to be here um, I just wanted to really start out by saying, um, ever since I started to work on issues around uh, inclusive communities and promoting 
you know, the rights of all of us to participate fully in society as um, members, you know, of various backgrounds and um, experiences, but all here to, you know, be a part of, you know, a greater, a greater country where we're all free to, to be who we are um, and have that respected. Um, it was a real, um, to be honest, um, a pleasant surprise to learn about the labor movement when I first started out um, working in, in this space uh, around 2012 is when I started to work at the National Council of Canadian Muslims. And before I get into just the trauma of the past few days and the, the horrific mass murder act of terror against the Aswell family in London, Ontario, I just wanna say that um, these spaces that um, labor councils provide that, you know, people like Ainsworth is here and John Cartridge invited me to come and all of you who I, some of you who I know, some of you who I have yet to meet and hope to one day in person. The work that is done in these spaces are so significant and have an impact on people like myself who um, I remember in the midst of the advocacy in the, you know, 2012, 2013, where I started to realize how hate was, for example, impacting Canadian Muslims, but then started to realize how other communities were impacted as well. There's a moment where you feel very alone. You feel very much that um, you don't know where to turn. You don't know how to mobilize your communities. You don't know how to educate folks about their rights. You really don't know what to do. And I, I remember that feeling of helplessness very, very starkly. And I will be truly honest that it wasn't until I became acquainted with really what the labor movement could do that I remember feeling my spirits lift. And one of those people that really helped me understand the power of the labor movement is someone many of you know very well, and that's Mohammed Hashim, who used to be a senior organizer with the Labor Council, and who, you know, John had really given him lots of space to work with our communities and help us to understand how we can mobilize. And I just want to say that that was such a gift for someone like myself, um, because what was going on, you know, 2012, 2013, 2014, is that we had a federal government, as many of you recall and try to forget, um, in Stephen Harper and the Conservatives, who was, of course, attacking all of us in different ways, women, racialized communities, Indigenous communities, workers. I mean, it was full-on attack on all of us. And at the time, you know, with regards to Canadian Muslim communities, he said that the biggest threat to Canada was Islamicism, which was not even a word. He just made it up. But everyone knew what he meant. And when he did that, you know, it was really, um, it was really a strong signal that those who hold racist and discriminatory views against our communities, you know, had a, a carte blanche, you know, had a, had a full pass to start to, to discriminate even more vocally. And he was sort of our, our pre-Trump, to be honest. Um, you know, he was a little smarter than Trump, but certainly many of his policies echoed what we were seeing and eventually would see down south. And um, that sort of opened up a very, very scary chapter for our communities, even though we had, of course, had Islamophobia for a long time before 9-11, got worse with 9-11, through the rise of these horrible criminal groups like Daesh and the constant terrorist attacks that were being done in the name of our faith, um, of course, was creating a very negative atmosphere that was further weaponized and used against us by conservative politics, by right-wing politics, as we know that that is a tactic that is used to divide workers. It is a way to try to pander to political base in which unfortunately there is often ignorance, there's often racism, and it was such, we were such an easy target because a lot of people didn't know very much about our communities. And certainly if you recall with the niqab, the, the face veil that women would wear, um, all of a sudden it became the number one issue in the 2015 federal election for Mr. Harper. And almost immediately as he started to attack our communities in that election, we saw a rise in harassment of Muslim women. We saw um, vandalizing of the, the campaign signs of the NDP or the Liberal Party because they were standing in solidarity with our communities. And you really saw that very, very negative climate. And the reason it's important to go, I mean, I could go further, but to even just to go that far is to say that 
there was a real politicization of Islamophobia at that time in a way that we hadn't seen as strongly before. Not to say that there wasn't anti-terror legislation introduced throughout the 2000s that wasn't deeply problematic and that eroded our civil liberties, but we still saw, for instance, uh, at the time Prime Minister Jean Chrétien come to a mosque after 9-11 and at least even if it was performative, but nevertheless sending a signal that people shouldn't be attacking us in, in broad daylight versus what we saw with Harper, which was, as I said, open season in our communities. And so that's the sort of the climate that, that was being fanned and, and, and pursued right up until the horrific attack on the Quebec City uh, mosque in 2017. And when that happened, um, you know, I remember just thinking to myself, you know, it. It, it's not surprising. We've, we've been bracing for this moment. We've been bracing for it because of the, the, the as I said, that weaponization of Islamophobia a few months prior, um, then leader of the NDP, Thomas Mulcair, had actually brought into the House of Commons a motion to condemn Islamophobia, which the Conservatives did not support, as many of you know. And um, that was really just to indicate the type of tenor that was happening in the House of Commons. And what our leaders say, as many of you know, really impacts on that public discourse. And that's why it's so important that we um, hold them accountable, at, you know, not only for their, their, their words, their actions, both are really critical. And so um, when that massacre occurred, all that work that had been done with the labor movement, so to learn about how to mobilize, to learn about how to organize and educate folks, to get city municipalities to pass motions, for instance, to support, you know, what we did was the Charter of Inclusive Communities around 2016, to get people to talk and condemn Islamophobia and other forms of racism. All that work was really important and helped us when we had to address that horrific massacre and figure out how do we build coalitions? How do we pressure the politicians to take action on the impact of Islamophobia? And when we take action on Islamophobia, we're actually taking action on all other forms of discrimination and racism because they're all coming from that same poison tree, white supremacy, colonial attitudes, all of it is that one poisonous tree and it has its, you know, its tentacles out into all of our communities and all the intersectional sort of components of our communities because I can't talk about anti-black racism without talking about Islamophobia in certain instances or anti-ableism, anti-indigenous, anti-Semitism, all of these are part of a whole that we have to com combat together. Um, and so we did a lot of work. We did a lot of work after 2017. And to be honest, what was what was the outcome? Well, we were able to win um, the recognition and the commemoration of January 29th as a national day of remembrance uh, of the Quebec mosque attack and action against Islamophobia. It took four years to get the government to do that. And the reason, again, was the resistance and the fear of even using the term Islamophobia. Because as we remember, um, when there was a motion M103 to condemn it around uh, right after the massacre, there were anti-Muslim rallies right across this country. And I would say it was a moment where that right wing, far right groups were really mobilizing and growing in this country. And again, when we were seeing those protests and those anti-Muslim rallies, and we'd go to them, who would we see shoulder to shoulder with us? It was labor. It was the workers. There's an incredible video that we filmed, uh, I think it was right around 2016, um, right in front of Toronto City Hall. And if you look around, all of the signs, many of the signs are from unions standing in solidarity with Muslims in this country. And I can't tell you how important it was to have that and continues to be that worker solidarity that many people you know, really take for granted and which I know everyone here realizes the power that all of you hold. Um, which brings us now to this, this horrific, horrific act of terror that occurred in London, Ontario last Sunday that many of us are still really grappling with. Um, you know, it's, it's um, I, I've kind of likened it to, you know, when you sort of get punched over and over and over again, the first time you get punched, you know, you get back up again, get punched again, get back up again. There's a moment where you, you almost feel like you can't get back up again. And I can tell you that for many of our communities, um, like this is, this is, 
it's been very difficult. It's been very difficult. Um, and, you know, and I say that as an advocate who works in these spaces and who finds so much inspiration from gatherings just like this one that helps propel me and gives me the strength to keep going. But I, I certainly will say that this, this has been a very, very difficult. And as I said, we, we were already feeling very much saddened by the discovery of the indigenous children because we all are connected. And anyone with a heart, um, anyone who understands the, you know, the trauma of fellow um, humans in our in our society, you know, can cannot not be affected. And so, in that in the context of all of this, in the context of the pandemic, um, the loss of Salman, Madiha, Talat, Yumna, thinking about little Fayez in the hospital when he's out and has lost his entire family, all because and someone hated hated them so much he didn't know them didn't know anything about them but this climate that exists that some people are being drawn to for whatever reasons we still don't know all the evidence here but for whatever reason this young person very young a 20 year old man was so overcome and consumed with hatred for people who looked muslim that he in that split second, whatever it was, he said it was premeditated, he thought about it and chose them um, and took away their lives in that moment simply because of who they were. And it, it, it's just beyond, it's beyond understanding. But as I said, these are all intertwined. It's about hate, it's about otherization, it's about dehumanization. When you look at a community or you look at communities and you don't see them as fully human, you know, the system that sent those indigenous children to those residential schools, they did not see them as humans. They did not empathize with them as children who needed their parents and their families. They had dehumanized them, just as this driver dehumanized that family, did not see them as a family, did not see them as human beings. And that is what it is for us as workers together to fight against, that dehumanization, to say that we have to figure out ways not only to hold politicians accountable and ask for better policies, ask for concrete steps to take. And I've written about the concrete steps. There are many things that we expect from policymakers to do and that we as workers have to hold them to it. You know, and, but, but there's the heart. We have to reach the hearts of people. We have to get through to them and we have to figure out how do we ensure that we are not letting any communities around us or anywhere be dehumanized in this manner. And so that is the challenge for the labor movement. And it is a mighty challenge, but I am really hopeful. And as I said, it's what keeps me going is knowing that there are folks like all of you out there who are committed, who are up on a Saturday morning talking about these things after a very difficult, hard year and a half of this pandemic, tired of Zoom calls, tired of not being able to see each other in person, and yet still doing the work. So I really wanna thank each and every one of you for giving me this space um, and continuing to see this work being done. It is important work and it does have an impact. And I just wanna thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Amira, for those uh, sobering words. Um, hate and oppression is nothing new. It's, it's, it's been with us for a while since the enslavement of African people. And of course, the colonization of indigenous people. And this hate continues to perpetuate through, throughout our society today. So it's, it's no surprise that we see the unfortunate and continued attack on the Muslim community. Um, in 2019, I believe, the CLC uh, released a report on anti-Islamophobia initiative with some key recommendations, with some critical tools in how to combat Islamophobia um, in our unions, um, um, employers, tools that employers could use, and of course, government. But let's, let's focus on the workplace for a minute, um, on the labor movement rather. How, how frustrating it is to see we continuously 
you know, talk about these reports, continues to give recommendations, but it seems as if unions are dragging their feet in action in a lot of these very doable initiatives and very important initiatives. How frustrated does that make, make you and all of us? Um, change takes time. And um, I think that, I think what's really important is that we just keep pushing. You know, um, if we, if we focus on all the things that are not getting done, that in and of itself will take our energy away. All we can do is, you know, keep pushing and keep looking for opportunities. And what, as, as I said, I loved about understanding how the labor movement worked is the way that it's quite systematic in terms of how you make change. So for instance, Ainsworth, uh, the CLC report on Islamophobia that I've provided the links for in the chat, um, that is a that was sort of a start of like saying, okay, we know there's a problem in this country. There's no doubt about it. Islamophobia is a, is a, is a real disturbing phenomenon and it plays out in different ways. All of these forms of racism and discrimination are, are similar, but they do have a unique aspects as well. And so that means that you'll have different types of medicine to deal with it. And so with the labor movement, you start out with that educational piece. The education is so important. And so with that education, with talking about these issues, you know, it was four years ago that I was at the CLC convention and we're just preparing now for our first virtual one next week. But when I was there and we had the panel discussion and we we're talking about discrimination and anti-Black racism and anti-ingenuity and all of all of the different types of discriminations, you know, it was about educating members. Then we created this report because of members who said, we want information, we want to make change. The report was created, as you said, Ainsworth, there are many recommendations for trade unions, for employers, for government. It's in a, in a very impressive document that was created by our human rights department. And so from there, Next is to take that information within our labor councils and talk about it and figure out and build the coalitions with community groups and see how can we empower each other. You know, because that one of the issues and one of the challenges is that, and it's the crux of, of, again, what we do in the labor movement, it's organizing people. We need to figure out how do we organize our communities, for instance, to pressure politicians to, for example, reinstate the anti-racism directorate which the Ontario government all but dismantled, right? This is a very serious problem because if you don't have, as you know, dedicated funding, dedicated resources, take this seriously. Look at the governments, the provincial government's policies and how they're impacting on racialized communities. If you don't have um, resources to do the public awareness work, don't have the resources to ensure that our police services actually know how to address hate crimes because for the longest time hate crimes were like okay whatever like honestly whatever we can't take a report from you even if someone reported and most people don't even trust the police they're not going to report that's why we've been trying to push for third party reporting of hate crimes which is something i just wrote about um for example and this is something labor councils can take on we can actually get you know, community health centers, local community associations to take reports of hate and then send them on to the police to investigate and follow up on. Why are we re-victimizing folks who really are not comfortable going to the police to be re-victimized again about what they're going through? And I've been told directly from our police chief here in Ottawa that this is possible. We can absolutely do this. And, and it is something that will help increase people's reporting so we know what's happening out there. Two thirds of Canadians do not report hate crimes. And that means that that's 300,000 incidents of hate crimes that were recorded, self-reported in 2014, according to Statistics Canada. So what we see in the actual police reported hate crimes is a drop in the bucket. People do not report what's going on. So if we don't know, if we can't properly assess the problem, how are we going to cure it? How are we going to do that? So that's just one example of empowering our communities and workers to push politicians to actually make policy changes that will have an impact. Thank you so much for answering that question, uh, Mira. 
much appreciated. We, we really wanted to open the floor for a bit more question, but uh, we're a bit crunched for time. So we will be moving on to the next next agenda. But of course, uh, I'm sure um, when we visit our workshop, we, we will all immerse into many of the conversations that will be had there. So next on the agenda is uh, Mohamed Amir. He's a member of the American Federation of Musicians, Local 149. Uh, Mohamed Ali, the vocalist, the social vocalist, is an MC, poet, and social justice organizer, who has performed at hundreds of social justice, human rights, and community-based events for well over a decade. You can find Mohamed Ali on Spotify uh, under the artist Mohamed Ali and under the album Labor of Love. And you can find him on social media at uh, uh, social socialist hip hop, uh, and of course, I think this is going to be put into chat. Uh, Mohammed, oh, there we go. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes. Can everyone can. see me? Oh, look yeah. There we go. Muhammad Ali, the socialist vocalist, um, going to be performing a piece called The Karma of Brown Folk, which was a bonus track on my album. I had created my album that's on Spotify, Labor of Love, and released it a few years ago, and then started working on music uh, that wasn't as political, that wasn't as workers' rights focused, I just did an entire album on it. So I took one of my favorite uh, songs, A Change Gonna Come by Sam Cooke. Um, which it was the anthem for the civil rights movement in America. And I took that music and I started writing a song about growing up brown in Canada. And before you know it, the personal story about myself um, and my daughter became a political song. It became an anti-racist uh, song, not uh, by design, but just by the lived experience that I was writing on paper. So this right here is called the Karma of Brown Folk. And if you go on, on Spotify, you can hear it with the Sam Cooke change gonna come back in music behind it. And it goes a little something like this. Who am I? Am I not what I'm supposed to be? Let me tell you about these roads that were proposed to me. I should be, be a doctor or an engineer, drive a cab to pay tuition for the seven years. They call us model minorities, expected to set examples and show the monarchy loyalty. Never free, indentured in anything that we ventured in our inventions, our medicine, everything. The karma of brown folk, cardamom chai teas, masala with brown cloves. They love our saris and our steel pan flows. We and the household, but our names they can't pronounce though. Samir, not Sammy. Abdullah, not Abby. The saints of rap name, born and raised Muhammad Ali. Descended from the sheikhs and sings who changed history. How could I hide my heritage? You kidding me? Because many men distressed about me love in my eyes god but they can't see i'm trying to breathe they won't let me be me some people trying to take my rights away they put a hold on my visa they want me to leave go back to mauritius down by port louis better watch for the cops and them customs police because they trying to take your rights away this for amira my firstborn this for my ancestors i talked to him this for prashad his words of wisdom yo this that karma of brown folk living. When they came for Islam, you weren't brown and said nothing. You weren't Muslim. That always got you across customs. Everybody silent, barely anybody called out. Now the NSA taps your line every time you call out. They said, Mo, stop playing the race card. Hey, Mo, stay in your lane and race hard. Better yet, bro. Speed up and chase God. Let's flip the script. How about you embrace unfair odds? You channel your inner Gandhi. Shave your beard in the lobby. Hide your accent when you talk it. Oh, they treat you like Gaddafi. How it feels to be lumped in with terrorism. Scary, isn't it? I'm not even Arabic. They don't know what the difference is. Rock Trayvon's hoodie. Rock Malala's hijab. Rock Trayvon's hoodie. Rock Malala's hijab. Rock Trayvon's hoodie. Rock Malala's hijab. Rock, rock, rock. Because many men distressed about me. Love in my eyes, God, but they can't see. I'm trying to breathe. They won't let me be me. Some people trying to take my rights away. They put a hold on my visa. They want me to leave. Go back to Mauritius down by Port Louis. Better watch for the cops and them customs police because they trying to take your rights away. 
Muhammad Ali. That was the karma of brown folk. Um, I got one more piece for y'all. But before I go, I just want to tell y'all uh, a little bit about myself and uh, how I'm feeling today, basically. Um, I've been doing anti-racist music for well over 10 years. I think it's either just 10 years ago or a bit over 10 years since the last time that I performed this conference. I can tell you as activist artists uh, in Toronto um, and in the GTA area, this is an event that you always want to perform, but you recognize that everybody else always wants to perform. And you don't always get the chance to perform um, at this conference every summer. So it's been around 10 years. And even though it's on Zoom, I'm feeling very blessed, very grateful to be back. Um, and just talking, before I go into the, the last piece, just talking generally a little bit uh, about racism. Hi, Tim. Um, you know, been going through a lot of, of personal racism last year and this year, like many of us do every year, but especially the past year, year and a half. And I just want to talk specifically about workers' rights and how it relates to that. I have been very blessed, very grateful that for the past year and a half, uh, my supervisors, my bosses, specifically uh, Suzanne, uh, John Cartwright, Muhammad Akbar from the CPERG movement, um, have been people who are amazing anti-racist advocates. You, like, for example, you know with John Cartwright, uh, he is about it when it comes to fighting racism. And when you're dealing with personal racism in your life and you clock into work and you know the people that you know are your boss, your supervisor, that you never have to worry about them letting any kind of racism come into the workplace or tolerating any of that, um, it makes you grateful. And you know, I've been dealing with a lot of racism this year and last year, but I recognize how lucky I am and that that's what we have to fight for. We have to fight in every workplace that we have allies and advocates uh, like I have had this year and last year, because you know that's so important when you're, you're stressed out and dealing with racist bullshit, excuse my language, that you know you don't have to worry about it when you're punching the work and, when you, before, and while, while you work all day. So I just wanna say that, I just wanna say thank you to Labor Council, thank you to the organizing committee. And with that, I'm gonna go into my last piece I cannot wait to perform this one at Queen's Park, at City Hall, at rallies uh, for years to come. Um, I've only performed this, I'd say about two handfuls of times. It's pretty straightforward, does not need a setup. Y'all will get it, but I can't wait for y'all to chant the chorus with me in person the next time we have a rally uh, at Queen's Park, at City Hall, a conference at the Sheridan Convention Center. It's called Make Racists Afraid Again, and it goes a little something like this. We gotta make racists afraid again. MAGA hat racists afraid again. Gotta make racists afraid again. Alt-right racists afraid again. Gotta make racists afraid again. MAGA hat racists afraid again. Gotta make racists afraid again. Make the alt-right racists afraid again. First verse ain't a sermon. Its purpose is to service. Racists who asserted that they never would service. Saying every person in a, in a turban is a serpent, making certain we they servants, making curtains under serfs them. We've been Plymouth Rock, El Haj Malik Shabazz. We've been Standing Rock, no pipeline on this path. We've been Willie Lynch, that's W.B. Du Bois. The lesson of oppression lies in whys and hows. Mike Pence in the White House got the kids in cages. Mike Brown got gunned down with no explanation. So with no hesitation, we the forsaken. For too long we've been waiting, so we here for the taking. Taking those who sit in silence to task taking down white pride worldwide, taking down all Nazi scumbags, taking back what's ours, taking back what's ours, gotta make racists afraid again. MAGA hat racists afraid again. Gotta make racists afraid again. Make those alt-right racists afraid again. Gotta make racists afraid again. MAGA hat racists afraid again. Gotta make racists afraid again. Make these alt-right racists afraid again. If you love to hate, man, you're clueless. I don't hate the hate, fam, that's useless. I hate the hate that hate produces because hate is abusive. So here's what the truth is. The truth is subjective, but if it subjugates justice, it's a tool of convenience that's corrupted. And if you won't correct it, then yeah, you guessed it. The truth is the racist shoe fits, wear it. I got brown skin in the game. This ain't a joke, no fairy tale. The emperor wears no clothes, no wardrobe to hide. The these xenophobes wanna see my throat choke and float from a rope. We've been living the life of being the have-nots. Nooses around our neck in a half-knot. So we'll not half the same old aftermath, taking back what's ours, taking back what's ours. Gotta make racists afraid again. MAGA hat racists afraid again. Gotta make racists afraid again. Make these alt-right racists afraid again. These black race racists afraid again. Build a wall racist, afraid again. The Fox News racist, afraid again. Tiki Torch racist, afraid again. 
proud boy racist, MAGA hat racist, blackface racist, build a wall racist, make racist afraid again. Muhammad Ali, the socialist vocalist, peace, love, solidarity, y'all. Ooh, we fire. Wow. Fire. 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 Well done, brother. Well done. Give, give him some reactions. Play with your emoji this morning. Give him some reaction, man. Amazing. Amazing. Fire. Thank you so much, my brother. So moving on to our keynote speaker. Uh, she's uh, Rosemary Powell. Uh, she's the executive director of the Toronto Community Benefits Network, which is a nonprofit community labor coalition representing over 120 member community organizations and groups, unions, and social enterprises. She has strengthened the coalition to create good jobs and opportunities through government investment in infrastructure and urban development for Black, Indigenous and racialized peoples with a focus on those who are youth, women, and newcomers. She's a passionate advocate for social, economic, and environmental justice. Throughout her career, she has advanced equitable approaches to policy development and implementation. Her community engagement and environmental advocacy work earned several awards for leadership and imagination. And of course, you can find our full bio uh, in the conference package. Rosemary, welcome. Thank you, Ainsworth. Can you hear me well? Oh, we can hear you well. Uh, excellent. Thank you very much. Oh, that was a powerful, powerful uh, piece of um, uh, poetry. It just uh, whew, warms my heart and just, uh, you know, just, just gives that inspiration to just keep moving forward. Uh, you know, thank you for the opportunity to share with you today at this very important conference that brings us together annually to reflect on our shared lived experience as Indigenous workers and workers of color rising above the storm, creating the future we want, tackle oppression, share wisdom. That's a theme that is at the core of the work that we do as a community labor coalition that was founded by our members to advance community benefits on major infrastructure and urban development projects. Again, my name is Rosemary Powell and I am the Executive Director of the Toronto Community Benefits Network. It is wonderful to be among you today, uh, fellow allies in the struggle to fight for equity and social and environmental justice. More than anything, I have appreciated the allyship of our brothers and sisters in the labor movement who have created space that allowed the TCBN to evolve into a 120 member strong community labor coalition that is black led with a majority of 14 member board and a tw 12 member staff representing the cross section of identities that CBAs are intended to benefit. Black, indigenous and racialized peoples including women, youth and newcomers. The Toronto and York Region Labor Council, the Labor Community Services, and the Labor Education Centre are founding members of the TCBN. And your unions might also be a part of the, this coalition. And if not, we invite you to join our movement. Incorporated in 2014, the Toronto Community Benefits Network is the only nonprofit organization in the City of Toronto with a mandate to negotiate community benefits agreements for major infrastructure projects and urban development projects, and to track, monitor, and support their implementation. The community benefits agreement process in Toronto builds on a well-established history of similar initiatives that have taken place in other locations in Canada and beyond, including over 300 impact benefits agreements that have been privately negotiated between Indigenous communities and developers. In just seven years together, we've built a community benefits movement with over 10,000 supporters and implemented workforce development initiatives that have reached over 1,000 people. We have accomplished these results through pursuing four strategic objectives, community benefits programs, community benefits campaigns and agreements, membership, outreach and communications, and community-based research and capacity building. My own experience in Canada as a Black woman immigrant has been one characterized by struggle, systemic racism, and discrimination. 
This started as soon as I arrived in Montreal, Quebec at the age of 16, where I was placed in the French school system and set back for years of education so I could learn the French language first before being given the rights to move on in my education. This was a racist law, Bill 101, that has stunted the growth and prosperity of many, including my own family members and friends. Thankfully, I was able to rise above it and to build a solid foundation for myself and my family because my story is also one of resilience, self-empowerment, and community support. Canada has a long and deep history with racism, and it continues to manifest in terrifying ways. The controversy over religious symbols in Quebec reminded everyone that there is a deep-seated racism, Islamophobia, and intolerance that is entrenched within the fabric of our society. Yet to this day, Quebec has not recognized the existence of systemic racism in their society. For me, it was just such a violent place to be uprooted from my homeland and transplanted. The discovery of 215 bodies of children found in Kamloops, British Columbia, is also a stark reminder of the continued experience of Indigenous peoples on their own lands. And as a Black immigrant woman, I stand in solidarity with the Indigenous peoples of Canada, who by far share some of the same experiences of displacement, discrimination, and social inequality. And this is why, even though as an organization, the TCBN has not had a good track record of supporting Indigenous peoples into the jobs and opportunities created through community benefits, I commit to putting every effort into learning, building relationships, and improving our practices to do better. I will never give up hope. We are just finalizing a research project with York University and the operating engineers, which seeks to identify strategies our community labor coalition can take to collaborate with indigenous communities in Toronto in a spirit of truth, reconciliation, and friendship. The taking of the lives of three generations of Muslim families in London, Ontario is also another hateful act meant to drive fear in that community and is an example of Islamophobia and systemic racism in our society. And it seems to be so impenetrable. The year 2020 was unlike no other and it brought right to the surface the reality of systemic racism, anti-Black racism, Islamophobia, anti-Haitian hate, all wrapped up into a manifestation of white supremacy that is entrenched in our systems of education, politics, justice, policing, and our economy, including in the development process. Right on the heels of the George Floyd murder by police officers in Minneapolis in 2020, nooses were left on construction sites for Black workers to find right here in Toronto, making it clear that they were not welcome or safe if they continue to work there. In speaking with our partner contractors and unions, I know they were embarrassed by this. This is not the culture that they want to see flourish within their workplaces. And surely they see the need to make a firm commitment to eradicating systemic racism and anti-Black racism and to increase diversity in their workforce through community benefits. TCBN, we were pleased to see the response of our construction unions and industry associations coming together with the city of Toronto to create a declaration for inclusive workplaces and communities, making it clear that racism and anti-Black racism will not be tolerated on the job site. The unions and contractors who were involved in those incidents took action to implement policies, provide training, and some cases like with the Carpenters Union, they held the perpetrator to account. But the industry needs to do more. And, and really, this is a time of reckoning. And like I said earlier, while 2020 was unprecedented in many ways, systemic racism has a long and deep roots in our society. A foreseeable outcome of this systemic racism right here in Toronto is the forced segregation of peoples due to poverty. Professor David Halchensky's report highlights the three cities in Toronto where black and brown people are concentrated in poor neighborhoods. With Toronto's accelerated growth, developers are now looking at those same communities to revitalize and redevelop, often without any intentional consideration about the impacts on these vulnerable communities. Even in circumstances when developers promised to carve out benefits for communities to appease them and to move forward, 
with their proposed project, often these benefits promised did not materialize. Where are those residents to live when due to this revitalization, they won't be able to afford to live in their neighborhood again? Examples that will come to the forefront of your minds is the Casino Woodbine example, the Regent Park redevelopment, Lawrence Heights. You've probably heard about the devastation Little Jamaica has been going through over years and exasperated by development. Had it not been for the intervention of the community in the multi-billion dollar region, regional transit development plan, this legacy would have undoubtedly continued. Working in Jane and Finch, I developed a keen interest in the concept of green jobs. I had a general sensitivity to the negative health impacts of environmental degradation and climate change because of my own daughter becoming asthmatic once we arrived in Toronto. I became involved through my work with other Jane Finch residents who were demanding a seat at the table when government was discussing plans for massive investment in public transit. This is how I got exposed to the potential of community collaborating with organized labor. Five years ago, right about at this time, I was tapped on the shoulder to consider an incredible opportunity to take on the role of executive director at the TCBN. And this was very exciting to me because it was a continuation of work I had already started back in Jane Finch. And here I am today, I am fully engaged in work that I'm passionate about, working as a professional in the construction industry, an industry that I would have never been exposed to, especially as a black woman, ensuring that whenever infrastructure is being built, that community has a voice at the table and can contribute meaningfully in driving the vision. Walking around in any neighborhood in Toronto, and you will see that every second person is not white, but not so on our construction sites. You would have to pass at least eight, and depending on the trade, up to 19 people before you see a hint of color. How can this be? How can this be allowed to continue all while our young people are dying on the streets, literally? I can't forget the desperation, the pain, the loss that was experienced back when I worked in Jane and Finch, when one more young man died right outside my window during the middle of the day while I was on the job. And the sad thing is that this wasn't the first time that an incident like this occurred, and it wasn't the last. This injustice has fueled my passion and has shaped how I show up in this world. As a community labor coalition, our challenge is to hold our elected representatives accountable and to demand better from the industry. Through community benefits, we are bringing pressure to bear to ensure commitment to a more inclusive development process as we seek to recover from this pandemic and economic recovery that prioritizes groups disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. TCBN's work is supporting the implementation of CBAs in Toronto, and it includes designing and partnering with groups within its vast community network to build and operate strategic pathways for those targeted to benefit from CBAs into employment. These include a citywide community outreach and engagement process to promote CBAs and their employment opportunities, one-of-a-kind apprenticeship readiness and mentoring programs, an employment services pathway that markets community members to contractors and unions associated with CBAs and ensure they recruit and hire graduates of many pre-apprenticeship programs across the city. TCBN has spent the last four years evaluating the local pathways into construction projects, building and testing prototypes to address systemic barriers in the supply side, and consulting with industry partners to making recommendations to address systemic barriers on the demand side. As a result of these activities, we've set the standards and for best practices and set the bar for generating systemic changes within institutions that lead the sector and hold the purse strings. We have built prototypes that can achieve the social outcomes for building back better. We've done the research and have found many examples from North American municipalities who have adopted similar policies, some who have adopted policies as early as in the 1990s. Many of these municipalities have established minimum hard targets, upwards of 40%, equity hiring with tracking, monitoring and reporting systems, 
specific language for project agreements and robust plans for implementation. New York set a 30% equity hiring in the midst of COVID-19. Armed with this clear evidence, TCBN mounted a campaign in late 2020 to press the city of Toronto to adopt a 10% equity hiring on construction projects they procure. And guess what? We won. There is no excuse. Here in Toronto, we have a track record and we can build on. We have six community benefits projects that TCBN is supporting to implement right now. You're probably aware of the Eglinton Crosstown LRT, the Finch West LRT. We have a community benefits agreement on the Casino Woodbine because communities stood up and they pushed back. The region park redevelopment for phase four and phase five project now has community benefits requirements and the West Park Healthcare Center and York University has community benefits and there are more underway. And we're now seeing hundreds of people who wouldn't have otherwise gotten into the industry who are now working due to community benefits agreements. The government of Canada has recently identified infrastructure as a key component of Canada's economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. TCBN and our community labor allies across Canada collaborated to implement an inclusive recovery campaign to press the federal government to include community benefits agreements as part of their plans and our efforts have paid off. The government of Canada just announced its $12 billion funding towards four shovel ready transit projects in Toronto. The Ontario line, the Scarborough rapid relief transit replacement, the Eglinton Crosstown LRT and the Young North subway extension. This funding will cover 40% of each project and they will have a CBA requirement. It's our time now as a movement across Ontario to the, the, the provincial government to ensure that this commitment is realized. And if there's any parting word that I'd like to share with you is to take heart. These incredible achievements that we're see seeing through community benefits are really happening because as a community, we demand better, we dared to demand better, and we organized. And through the community benefits process, one project at a time, we are indeed creating the future we want and tackling oppression. Let's keep the momentum going by sharing our wisdom and standing with each other to rise above the storm. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you so much, Rosemary, for delivering that message. And most importantly, please continue to do that very, very important work that you're doing for our community. Thank you so much. And moving on to the next agenda item. I think we're gonna be sharing uh, a slide or two. So, great. So uh, I want to take this moment to, uh, to recognize uh, the achievements of Hassan Youssef and uh, Marie Clark Walker, uh, two pioneering and inspirational workers of color who are leaders of our national labor movement as they retire from their position. Thank you, Marie, and thank you, Hassan, for the amazing work that you've done over the last uh, uh, several years. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, I we had a lot of um, questions about the, the music from this morning. So I've just um, in the chat put um, the, the, the names of the playlist from this morning. So everyone has that. And I'm just going to explain what's going to happen next. So um, momentarily, you're going to be moved into your um, to your workshop work so workshop sessions um, and um, then you're going to take a five minute break um, to ask that you please return to um, you know return back um, at 11 a.m sharp so that your workshops can begin on time uh, when 
um, after our workshops, uh, we are going to return back to the main room um, here where we're going to have, be having a draw for 24 um, exciting prizes. And um, I wanna thank the following unions for their generous donations that made those prizes possible. SEIU Healthcare, OSSTF Toronto District 12, the Society of United Professionals, Local 160, QP 4948 Library Workers. And while you're in your workshop, please consider the following for when you return. One thing that you learned, one thing you wanna learn more about and one action that you'll take as a result of the workshop. Um, so you'll be able to um, add those reflections into the chat. I also wanna thank very much all of the staff that have worked tirelessly to make today possible. Um, Sharon Simpson, Rochelle um, uh, Humaya, uh, Faduma Mohammed, so Simon Sung and Matt Dusenberry, and of course, John Cartwright and Andrew Babington for their leadership. So we're going to move you now into your breakout sessions and please make sure that you return or sorry yeah into your workshops and please make sure that you return um, to your computers at 11 o'clock so your workshops can begin on time. Thank you. Good morning folks uh, just a message from uh, uh, the admin here. Uh, we've done our best to pre-assign everybody based on their registration forms to the correct room. However, depending on your Zoom account, we may not have been able to match you with your choice. So if you want to uh, go ahead and select the room, the breakout rooms are all now open. If you want to go ahead and select the room that you chose uh, based on your registration, feel free to go ahead and do that now during the break. Thank you. Uh, welcome back, everyone. I hope you all found you the workshops uh, inspiring and thought provoking. Uh, before we uh, do the report back and hear about your amazing experiences, I wanna take a moment to introduce an amazing trailblazing black woman and our new president of the Toronto and York Region Labor Council, Andrea Babington. Andrea has been on the Labor Council Executive Board since 2004, serving Eight years as vice president. As the first woman of color to sit as president, Andrea is committed to fighting for a just eco economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. Equality and justice for all workers. Growing the labor movement by increasing union density and fighting for climate justice to ensure a future for her children. Andrea, floor is all yours. Thank you, thank you, thank you, my brother. And I, I just want to say, you know, we are just a little bit past 12, just to say good afternoon to uh, my sisters, my brothers and comrades. I'm, I'm really happy to be here to speak to you uh, uh, today. And I'm really happy that on a, a lovely day like this, uh, we are able to meet and knowing quick, fully well that with the pandemic that we're not able to meet the usual way in person. And yet everyone is willing to come out and virtual to talk about and hear about the, the issues at hand. I, I want to start by, by echoing the pain expressed by my sister Amira and brother Merv King, who spoke earlier about the unhearthing of the tragedy at uh, Kamloop Residential School, as well as the cowardly Islam Islamophobic attack in London that just last week, my heart grows heavy seeing the violence that this country is comfortably doling out to people just because of the, the color of our skin, our, uh, our faith. After living in Canada for so long, at times I, I, I become almost hardened to the petty indecency that become part of our everyday life in this racist country. I'm embarrassed to say, but you almost grow accustomed to it. I'm not sure people in this uh, conference know what I'm talking about. The ways we have to close ourselves off, the way we must contort who we are, the way 
we are told to sit down, shut up. You almost get used to it. It's hardened the heart. But to see the bodies of 215 children being unhurthen from the ground after being stolen from their family become too much for the soul to bear. Seeing three generation of family swipe away in an instant through an act of, of veil, racism become too hard to ignore. It reminds us who we are and why we must fight for change. It become hard maintaining that determination, that courage, hard to wake up every day and, and fight what can sometimes feel like a losing battle for equality. COVID-19 cause numbers, numbers are trending down and we, are, we start to see some light at the end of the, the tunnel. But for workers of color, that light may be a speeding train. The pandemic has ravaged community of color with the highest infection rate and debt in our region, our community, which are most densely packed with essential workers are struggling economically as well. Workers of color most likely to have taken on debt, falling behind on bills during the pandemic. We know that for recovery to happen, these communities need to be prioritized for both their health need, their economic needs, our communities to recover that mean paid sick days, well-paid union jobs. These sort of programs don't just crop on their own. To get justice to workers of color who are struggling the most, that mean government intervention. But the politicians have abandoned us. For Doug Ford, conservative government, a COVID response mean allowing vaccination rate to be lowest in community where infection rates have been highest. Doug Ford was so cowardly and afraid to face the public outcry for the damage he has done that he refused to even make media appearance for most of those last few months. This is a premier who feel comfortable taking paid sick days after repeatedly denying denying the same rights to so many workers. At the federal level, things aren't much better. Justin Trudeau likes to talk about big games, especially equality. He likes to kneel for the camera and cry during apology, but that doesn't make, doesn't amount to real change. Real change would mean instituting the recommendation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to begin the process of healing for indigenous people in this country. Real change would mean looking into the missing and murdered indigenous women in this country. Real change would mean disarming and defunding the RCMP, not increasing their budget. Both Trudeau and Ford attended the vigil held in, in London for the Hafsi's family after the Islamic uh, van attack just this past week. While I'm glad to see the family and the community being supported, we know from experience that all these politicians offer us are empty words and hollow prayer. It's easy for them to show up to a photo op, but it's harder to do the real work of making positive change for our community. As Dr. Martin Luther King said, it's much easier to integrate a lunch line than it is to guarantee an annual income for people of color. It is much easier to disintegrate a bus than it is to make reparation. And we all know it's much easier to make statement than it is to put an end to the violence that target people of color in Canada. But these politicians are only interested in what's easy. This is a cause to be optimistic. There is a cause to be optimistic, however. While the politician and the bosses have not changed consciousness of the public, the public, the, the general public is growing. The last year in this, in this particular has seen mass movement of racial justice in our region and abroad. And it is, a, it is clear that working people are ready to see real change. 
a year after George Floyd murder, we are still seeing mass movement with people stepping up to help one another and to give solidarity to those fighting racism everywhere. What this means for all of us in the labor movement, that it is time to stop working, to work, stop working on politician schedule and start making good trouble, get things, get things done our way. To, to it's clear that bosses and politicians look back at the demonstration of the past year and ask themselves, demonstration of what? Because they haven't been moved to make change. In the labor movement, we know politicians and the bosses only care about one thing and that's their pocketbook. Threatening their bottom line is the way we win. To show them what maintaining this racism system means, we need to hit them where it's hurt. Keeping this racist system intact means keeping workers of color excluded, putting workers of color in jail, and worse of all, killing them in the prime of their lives. Well, guess what? When they exclude us, their road are unpaved. When they jail us, their children go untaught. When they kill us, the sick and the elderly in this country go untreated. To remind them how essential each and every single one of us in this country is, we need to be prepared for mass strike action to show them what a world without us look like. And when they start to come to the table and listen, we need to show them we aren't interested in compromises. It's, comp it, it's compromise that has cost us all these years up until now and it's compromise which has cost us, cost us more lives than we can count. And now it's time for an end to the racist system in this country. But sisters and brothers, we must look into our own backyard as well. As well, we all know that when we are together, we win. But when we are alone, we merely beg. To set up on the path of victory, we must break down our barriers in our own union and institution. We must ensure we are all developing and training our young leaders of color and putting them into position of power. We must advocate and fight for changes in our constitution and our charter. We must ensure that when there is union meeting at the shop or at our local, that workers of color are, are in attendance and that their voices are heard. When I look around at the people gathered here today, I see real leaders. And that's why I'm confident we will win. I see leaders who aren't shy, who aren't afraid to be vocal and to make changes in their workplace. I want to ensure that the leaders we have here today don't let this feel like any other conference and that we, ta we take what we learn and have learned and discuss back in our union with us. I heard you to bring the Yes It Matter campaign from the Labor Council back to your leadership and implement it in your charter. Take a moment to look at the attendance of the, the next union meeting in your union and at your local and ask yourself how to increase those numbers. When we hear members discussing racism in the workplace, we need to get to them to, to a union meeting. When we see blocks of worker organizing around racism in the workplace, we need to unite them towards direct action. And when we see a whole workplace, a whole society full of people who are sick and tired of racism, sexism, homophobia, and all the form of discrimination in the workplace, we need to lead them to strike. The people are ready. They are looking for direction. And the leaders in this room need to be the one to take them where all this to go. We need to be the spark that ignite the flame. Yes, Labor Council have been on this journey for 150 years and we need to continue that. Today, we surely can say that we are in the highs of the storm, but together we can rise. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Andrea. Now, the Equity Committee has made a video to say thank you and goodbye to our former president, John Cartwright.
Hey, John. I was asked to record some of the memories you and I had together. I can remember the one time when we were campaigning against Mike Harris, leader of the Conservative Party and Premier of this province. I came in the back way, you came in the front door. You got arrested and I got a hell of a photo op. Having good times in those days. I can also remember the time uh, you and I and many other members of the building trades and Labor Council were campaigning at the Markham and Lawrence Mall. We were campaigning for against the GST. What a time that was. We had a good time. We're going to have a lot more good times together. You were business manager of the building trades, as well as president for 19 years. I can only say you've done an excellent job and thanks for all your contributions. John, thank you so much for all that you've done for the equity committee, for moving us forward as a community, as a society, as a nation. We will miss you dearly. All the best to you, my friend. Hi, John. This is just to say how much I appreciate all that you have done for me. You have always been a source of encouragement and guidance. My wish for you is that you continue to find joy in whatever you choose to do in the next phase of your life. Hey, doing, brother. Happy retirement, John, and enjoy yourself. Um, it was a pleasure working with you over the last several years, uh, both as an equity committee member and a member of the executive board. Um, one memory about you that really stick out is uh, getting that call and those odd days, you know, those non-prescribed days where you aren't working, asking for a favor, or rather asking you to do work. I probably won't miss those very much, but listen, um, it was a pleasure working with you and alongside you over the last uh, several years. I've, I've learned and I've grown quite a bit under your leadership. And I want to say thank you. And I want to say enjoy your retirement. Take care, my brother. John, it's been such a pleasure to work with you over the years, and I'm so grateful to have had the opportunity to work with you as the co-chair for the Toronto and York Region Labor Council Equity Committee, and I really wish you the very best as you make your way into this well-deserved retirement. I hope that you truly enjoy it, so take care. Hello, my name is Mark Brown, and I'm the Assistant Secretary Treasurer for the Canadian and the Postal Workers Toronto Local. I want to wish Brother Cartwright a very happy and a comfortable retirement. The Toronto Local of CPW has a long-standing history with the Toronto and York Region Labour Council. One of my most memorable moments is when postal workers were under attack from a racist newspaper called Your World News. Our members and others were being targeted by this newspaper because of their race, gender, or political affiliation. At that time, I was in the role of National Director for CFPW's Toronto Region. I, along with the then local president, the late Megan Whitfield, reached out to Brother Cartwright, as well as the Federation of Labor for assistance. Within a short period of time, we had a campaign up and running that sent your ward news scrambling to maintain their advertising revenue. Legislation such as Bill 148, Fair Workplace, Better Jobs Act, and the development of the Anti-Racism Directorate, all of these have this Labor Council and John Cartwright woven into their DNA. For that reason, on behalf of the Toronto Local Postal Workers represented by this Labor Council, and on behalf of our executive board, please permit me to wish you a very happy retirement and may you have many more years ahead of you. Thank you. Hi, I have known and closely working with John for the last 16 years. I respect his vision to stay focused and constantly look into the future about the best ways to move the interests of working people in Toronto and York region. John is one of those leaders who will not shy a difficult but necessary conversation. The equity agenda came to the forefront during his leadership at Labour Council. 
Most of his campaigns were inclusive environmental equity and access for marginalized community. John's vision and leadership will be missed and I wish on behalf of labor community, staff, board, and volunteers all the best for his next chapter of life. Thank you, John. Dear Brother Cartwright, over the past few years, through my involvement with the Labor Council and the Equity Committee, I've gotten to know you a lot. You're one heck of an amazing leader and your dedication to the labor movement will never be forgotten. You have helped create a lot of great labor related memories in my books and I've learned a lot through your leadership. Congratulations on your retirement and enjoy the next chapters in your life. All the best, Gobi, Local 4948. Library Workers Senior. The first time I met John is on our strike picket night. He came along with a lot of people and he made a powerful speech to encourage us keep on fighting until we get our first contract. And I think John is a incredible leader. He is able to recognize your strength and your passion. And then he collect all these people with different strength, came together to build up the society we want. I think his leadership set an example that everyone, everyone should learn from. Congratulations, John. Okay. So I would encourage everyone to add your reflections from your workshops into the chat. And just a reminder, um, you know, the reflections were one thing that you learned, one thing that you want to learn more about, and one action that you'll take as a result of the, the workshop. Um, I think it'll be helpful for us to, um, you know, to share that information with each other collectively. So uh, now is the time everyone has been waiting for. Um, and I, I know that uh, <laughs> we promised that we would um, have our, our draw. Um, and, and please, I encourage everyone to look through the chat and, you know, look at the reflections that everyone is sharing. Um, I think it's helpful to, uh, to see what, um, you know, to see what everyone is, um, you know, what, what reflection people have. Um, and while that's happening, I'm also going to um, move on to do our draw, which I know everyone is um, eager, um, you know, eager to uh, hear, you know, who our, our prize winners are. So I'll, I'll start again by um, thanking the generous unions that donated the money that um, were used uh, to make these prizes possible. And that is SEIU Healthcare, OSSTF Toronto District 12, the Society of the United Professionals, Local 160, and QP 4948 Library Workers. So we have 24 $25 gift cards to a different book list, which is an Afro-Canadian owned bookstore showcasing books from the African and Caribbean diaspora and the global South. So we've used a randomizer um, that has selected names of um, participants that are, are here. Um, so our, our committee members have done our best to make sure that, um, you know, you do need to be present to, uh, to collect the prize. And so what we will do is um, ask that, um, you know, if I um, read your name, that you, um, that you put your information into um, the Google form and I will I'll add it into the, the chat. Um, put your information into the Google form. All right, so um, I wish we had a drum roll. All I, pre all I prepared was a whole bunch of like really great soca music, but no drum roll, my apologies. All right, without further ado, let's start with our award winners. All right, 
So we have um, Jamal Warda, congratulations. Yunus Omahani, Veronica Montague, um, Ga um, Gary Ann Martin, Jordan Ford, Rosina um, Bodwani, Jason Belly, um, yep, Carolyn Egan, Audrey Gardner, Shafiq, um, Shafika uh, Aziz, Natalie uh, Rondo, um, and hopefully I am reading those names properly. Um, so I apologize if I um, mis mispronounce your name. Um, Brianna Plummer, Denzel Deza, Matt, um, Marjorie Nelson, Deanna Smith, Galen Cramps Crampsey, Emma Lee. And just a reminder, um, there is a, a Google form um, in the chat. And so if your name is read, then please go into the chat and complete the form so then we can make sure that we um, that we are able to send you your prize. Okay. Um, so Galen Cramsey, Emma Lee, Joe San Job, Tanya LaRush, and Tim Vining. Okay. So um, I'll go through the names one more time. That's Jamal Warda. Yunus Omahani, Verona Montague, Darianne Martin, Jordan Ford, Rosina Badwani, Jason Belly, um, Carolyn Egan, Audrey Gardner, Shafika Aziz, Natalie Rondo, Brianna Plummer, Denzel Deza, Madri, Med Majory, Majory, I'm sorry, Nelson, um, Deanna Smith, Helen Cramsey, Emma Lee, Josan Job, um, Tanya LaRush, and Tim Vining. Congratulations to all of you. And um, please make sure that you enter your information into the Google form um, so we can get you your prizes. Thank you so much to everyone for coming and spending your um, Saturday morning with us. We hope that um, this has been informative. Um, that and that you have enjoyed yourself here um, today. Uh, we worked really hard to put this together for you and we hope that you'll come back again next year. Um, so please take care, stay safe and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.